I have a few memories from being in Poland. Uh, the quiet courage of the Polish people. I can remember a group of elderly women praying uh, for the Pope and his visit in a novena, hour after hour, in a church downtown. I can remember our own staff uh, worrying about whether they would be in trouble. And uh, it sounds like it's out of a movie, but maybe it was a movie. Uh, turning up the radio in the bureau when we would have a uh, planning meeting in case there was electronic eavesdropping. Uh, I remember uh, going out to Father Papiuska's church in North Warsaw. North, this was just north of Warsaw. Um, after he was murdered. And um, I just wanted to go to Mass, so I went out to his church one Sunday morning, went to Mass, found myself lingering in the sanctuary, eventually wait, made my way to the vestibule. I was the last person there, except for one person, a Polish man who was selling religious articles. And I said, you know, I'll get a religious article for my aunt, who, who is tremendously religious. And I went over to him and uh, looked at his various religious articles, and he started talking to me in Polish. And I said, no, Polski. And his, he looked like this, and he went underneath, and he brought out solidarity pins. <laughs> <laughs> Solidarność. <laughs> I, we have uh, several more people to hear from, and then we're going to hear from the audience. Um, but I do notice that, um, uh, Walter Cronkite's successor as anchor has managed to stay with us, and, and I'm delighted to, uh, uh, Dan Rather is, is here. He uh, put on many of the stories um, of the later days of uh, solidarity, and, and um, if Dan, if you'd like to say something, I'd be delighted to have you. Well, thank you very much, and I'm uh, humbled and honored to be here, and especially want to appreciate, express my appreciation to the Consul General of the Republic of Poland in New York uh, for this wonderful occasion. Uh, memories abound of what we now call solidarity and the movement for freedom and democracy in Poland. And as I heard these stories recounted, so many memories uh, flow through my own mind. Uh, among them, first of all, the both brilliance and bravery of the CBS News correspondents producers and cameramen, some of whom are with us tonight. Um, if we can take just a moment to indulge me, and my good friend Bill, forgive me if you must, but uh, Bert Quint, one of the great television correspondents of this or any other time who spoke earlier. Uh, Susie Allen, whose beauty is matched by her bravery, who's with us here, who spent so much time covering solidarity. Sandy Sokolow, who was the executive producer of the CBS Evening News under Walter Cronkite and uh, when I first came to the anchor chair myself. A couple of things occurred to me that, you know, first of all, that the teaching of Polish history um, is slim to none in my own country and is something that needs to be addressed because our history as Americans is so intertwined uh, with the history of the Polish people. Uh, most American school children have no idea of the fact that, and it is a fact, that a Polish general and Polish troops helped save Western civilization in the Battle of Vienna when the Islamic tide was coming up. Uh, most have very little, if any, knowledge of the role that Poland's brave in the end, um, in the beginning, I should say, losing effort against uh, the Nazi Germanys. All of this is basically unknown and untaught to American school children. And I'd just like to say a word that you know, I hope that that can be remedied at least to a degree, because what happened in the very late 1970s and going into the 1980s was a lesson for all who love freedom and democracy. Number one, uh, that a free and independent press able to chronicle such events as they unfolded in Poland, free and independent press is the red beating heart of democracy and freedom. Secondly, that old line I think it comes from the student prince, hearts can inspire other hearts 
with their fire. And what happened with solidarity and what happened in Poland is the fire of the Polish people. Uh, it inspired us in America and eventually inspired the world. It's easy to forget that when solidarity, when the movement first began, there was a general belief, no way. You can pull for them, you can pray for them, but it isn't going to happen because fresh in our memories of what happened in Hungary, what happened in Czechoslovakia, which had been referred to um, earlier. But the spirit of the Polish people, and I'm reminded how much the spirit of the Polish people is intertwined with their religion. I can recall, I don't remember the exact date uh, that I was there for 60 minutes. It was before I came to the anchor chair of CBS News. We covered the pilgrimage to the Black Madonna uh, in Poland. And I remember saying to myself, Polish nationalism cannot be untwined, unintertwined with the Polish religion. It's something I think not fully understood to this day in this country. And the deep religious belief, the history of the Polish people with their church was so deeply intertwined with their nationalism and what made solidarity in the end succeed. Uh, I'm privileged to be here. I have a lot of yarns to spin, but I won't bore you with them. Whoever it was referred to the border incident, I'll try to end with some humor, that we drove into Poland with the late great 60 Minutes producer, Bill McClure, who had been there many times before. He'd driven through Poland on his way to Moscow. And we came across the border guard, um, and there was a the long line, and we finally got there. And I was saying to myself, this is going to take four or five hours. Uh, we got up, and McClure went to the back of his. He had an old Chrysler, a specially made Chrysler station wagon. It was so loaded down with equipment that the back bumper sort of hit the pavement as we went up. He went to the back of the car, got out something. He handed it to the guards. There was no search. There was nothing. We whizzed right on through. And I said, Bill, how did you do that? He said, I gave him about 50 copies, old copies of Playboy magazine. <laughs> That's how I got it. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Henning we had said it all when he said we were young then. It's good to remember that. But we were young in a system that was hopelessly old, decaying, and intending to remain so for all eternity. It was humiliating. It was hopeless. Um, we had a joke then that listed the five commandments that you have to follow if you are to survive under the system. Well, first, do not think. Second, if you have to, do not say it. Third, if you have to say it, do not write it. Fourth, if you have to write it, do not sign it. And fifth, if you have to sign it, well, do not be surprised. Uh, it seemed reasonable. Uh, and um, when Marshall Lowe struck, I did the unreasonable thing. I went around the war, so noted what I saw and um, wrote it up on onion skin. We, my wife and I wrote it up in a dozen copies and I started distributing the leaflets on the street. And suddenly I realized that I'm not afraid. I mean, yes, I was afraid. It was a different kind of afraid. I was afraid I'll go to jail. I was afraid they can beat me up. But suddenly I realized I wasn't afraid, the kind of afraid that I have been all my conscious life that I will decay, that I will become a vegetable. This was liberating, this was exhilarating, this was actually better than the best sex I ever had. <laughs> and the real fun of it, it stays that way. Um, Rick, you made this beautiful statement about the Polish on the Grand Press. Yes, it was impressive, it was powerful, but most important, it was great fun. There's really nothing better than the feeling of thinking, writing, okay, not signing, you're not exactly stupid, but publishing, and they can't stop.